house of the Lord. Amen. I'm thankful for what God's doing in my life. He is stirring me, taking me on a journey. And it was one that I needed. I have rededicated my life to him in every area. And I do not want this flesh to be alive in my life. I don't want it to rule any area, any part of my life. I want it to, I want to be in tune with God. I want to have God shake me. And I want to be able to hear from God to intercede for families and young people that are struggling. I don't want to just uh, say I'm going to pray for them and then not pray for them. I want to really pray, not just say a prayer, a little quick one, but to move into that spirit that God takes us in travailing prayer. To Sometimes you're going to mourn. Sometimes you're just going to be grieved so much by your spirit that you can't get up off your knees until you hear from God, till you know that God touched somebody. Amen? Fall stand for the reading of the word of God. Let's go to uh, 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to take my time. I'm not in a hurry. Uh, I want the spirit of the Lord to touch us. I want us to understand the importance of serving him in the time that we're living in. Because the devil is going to do his best to just try to uh, cause you to be so distracted. Um, 1 John chapter 3. Starting with verse number one, behold, what manner of love the father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And every man, and every man that hath this hope, the hope of his coming, in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Amen? You may be seated. I'm, I'm wanting to really get to that place where we understand that we're going to be like him. When he comes, we're going to know him. The world's not going to know him. But the Bible says that if you've been baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, and you've been uh, brought into this truth, that he that hath this hope of Jesus is coming back and you being like him because you know him, you purify yourself even as he is pure. In other words, you begin to take inventory on your walk with God. We are so caught up in a world that has no idea what's going on, amen? We live in a world that is so far from God that there's no fear of God anymore. Or that people could care less about God. Most young people have no idea who Jesus Christ is. We passed the ball field and it was full of parents and full of kids playing ball on Saturday. But they, they, they have no idea that Sunday's for church. I mean Sunday's. That Sunday's for church. Amen. They're out there and they're doing what they want to do. They're, they're raising their children in a way that, that church isn't important. And what's so sad is we've got people that come to God, that know God, some of our young people that want to stick their head out of the church and, and look and see what's out there in the world. I've got news for you. There's nothing out there. There's nothing out there that can satisfy. There's nothing out there that can please. There's nothing out there that lasts. I've been there, I know, and by the grace of God, I escaped that, amen? And for me to go back into that would be crazy because I know what, I, what it was like being there. I know what I felt. I know when I cried. I know when nobody heard me. I knew when I stood at a four-story window and I almost jumped. I almost jumped after my father had died because I was so distraught, so distressed. I, and I'm here to tell you, friend, that when God got a hold of me on April 9th, 1980, I have never looked back. I have never desired to go back to that way again. I remember the pain. I remember the hurt. I remember the disappointment. I remember the anger. I remember all the things that come along with this world. Amen. We live in a society that is impatient, wanting everything right now. We want God to hear us right now. We want God to answer our prayers right now. We want God to bless us right now. Everything has to be right now. The children of Israel felt that way also. Exodus 32, 1, 4, and 6. Notice what it says. And when the people saw that Moses delayed, you hear me? I wish every young person was in here today. 
I wish every young person was in here to hear this because this is what it's talking about. Now, the children of Israel, they made it through the, through, through, through the uh, Red Sea. They escaped. They were taken out of Egypt. And now they're wandering in the desert. And guess what happens? When they saw that Moses delayed, he was up on the mountaintop. He was up there. He was with God. But notice, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, when, they, when he delayed, I'm going to tell you something. Live for God. You better get used to some delays because God's time is not your time. I know we think we're so privileged and God, it's a, it's a privilege that you've got me serving you that I lift my hands and worship you, but that ain't got nothing to do with God, friend. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, and said unto him, up. Make us gods. Now, Moses hadn't been gone that long. But he had delayed coming down and they didn't know where he was at. They didn't know what was happening. So guess what? Out of the abundance of their heart, their mouth spoke. They just got delivered out of Egypt. They were in a place where there was nothing but idols and nothing but gods. And God, the one true God, delivered them. And now they find themselves in this delay, this little delay. And it just, oh, they, we, we want something now. We got to have something to worship now. They already had the God that delivered them. But they wanted something they could see. See, that's what's wrong with people that get twisted sideways and fall away from God. You begin to worship things you can see. You begin to want things out in the world because you think it's going to bring you happiness. You think it's going to bring you some enjoyment. But I've got news for you. It won't. They said, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses... The man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wrought not what has become of him. Now notice verse 4. And he received them, he received at their hand all their gold. He told them, get all your gold, all your, your jewels. Bring them here. And they brought all their gold with them. And he fashioned it, uh, Aaron fashioned it um, with a graving tool. Verse 4. After he had made it a molten calf, and they said, these be the gods, O Israel that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. In other words, they're looking at a golden calf and they're saying, this is what brought us out of Egypt. It wasn't the Lord God Almighty. It wasn't the one that parted the Red Sea. They're looking at a golden calf. They're looking at something that they saw in Egypt. They saw golden calves all over Egypt. They saw idols all over Egypt. And when God uh, delayed Moses is coming down off that mount, all of a sudden things began to happen to them. All of a sudden, they they began to weep and they began to cry and they wanted something right now. Give me something right now that I can see. After he made a molten calf and they said, these be the gods, O Israel, which wrought thee out of the land of Egypt. Now notice, gods, not the one true God. Now verse five, and when Aaron saw it, he buildeth an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, tomorrow is the feast to the Lord. See, that's the way our flesh works. We got us what we wanted. We got this idol. And now we're ready to have a feast unto the Lord. Even though that idol is an idol, they did kind of put God's name on it. They kind of said that they're going to worship. That's the God that brought us out of Egypt. Amen. And now what are they doing? They, they're saying, oh, we're going to have a feast tomorrow. Now we're going to have a feast. See, you think that the world's going to give you something and you reach out, you get out of church and you walk into this world. Well, number one, you're turning from light to darkness. And when you get out into the world and you start walking in the world, the old devil's going to tell you, you need something. You see something. You want something. And you can go to a charismatic church. You can go to one of these progressive Pentecostal churches that let you live any way they want to and say anything you want to say. Go anywhere you want to go. Listen to anything you want to listen to. Watch anything you want to watch. See, that's the devil telling you, see, you can have this. Go ahead and play in the world. Go ahead and have your fun. Tomorrow we have the feast. And they rose up early in the morrow and offered burnt offering, verse 6. Burnt offerings, brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now I want you to understand something. 
Now you listen to what they just did when they built their bolt, uh, golden calf and altar. Uh, Aaron built an altar in front of it and they offered on, they rose up early on the morrow and, uh, and burnt, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Everybody said rose up to play. A major motivator in the process of apostasy is contained within, the, within these words, and that's Moses delayed his coming. The reason people are backsliding, the reason people are falling away is because they're getting tired. They're, they're getting tired of waiting on God, and so they push themselves away. Moses delayed delayed his coming and that put them in a bad situation because they wanted something now and that's why so many young people in our church and other churches apostolic kids that's why they slip away into the world that's why they fall away that's why they they uh, began to drift that's why things begin to happen in their life they backslide is because it's not happening soon enough I, I want a boyfriend now I want a girlfriend now I, I want something now and they'll go and they'll get a job and that job will take them away from God and that's the plan of the devil amen because if you are not settled in your heart that you're going to live for God when you isolate yourself is it amazing that so many people when they backslide as soon as they walk out they cut off all communication with the children of God you know why they're worship, worshiping false idols they think they're okay because they've got a knowledge but they don't worship him according to knowledge God repeats this in the New Testament. When the church, when, when Christ warned that the evil servant says, my master is delaying his coming. And the Bible says in that setting, it says, because he said, my master delayeth his coming. He began to beat the men servants and the maidens. He began to eat, drink. And the Bible said, even become drunken. You know why? Because uh, God's delayed his coming. The Lord delayed his coming. And we got so many young people today and so many uh, young families today that get so tired because they won't. They want something their flesh wants. They, they have lost that zeal after God. They've lost that love for praying. They lost that love for getting on their knees and travailing. I've got news for you. The only way we're going to be saved, the only way your family's going to be saved, dads, you better listen to me, fathers, is that if you get on your face and you travail, because this world is going to get worse and worse, and it's going to challenge it. It's going to come at every young person there is. Somebody needs to learn how to travail. Somebody needs to get back to where God begins to take you and you cannot get off your knees until you know God has released that burden that you have. Unfortunately, this is what uh, has occurred today. God, now notice, God emphasis, emphasizes it, in, it just in case his children uh, children's endurance begins to lag. In other words, he's telling us, don't you dare be like that, that evil servant. That don't, don't, don't you dare be like them because God's delaying his, his coming that you're going you're gonna to be who you want to be and you're going to live the way you want to live. It's going to get good, so stay with me. He does not want anyone to turn aside to some exciting distraction or something of the surrounding culture. God warns us about uh, uh, going into the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. In other words, he doesn't want us to desire that. But what happens is that when we lose our burden and we lose our passion and we think God's not coming tomorrow, Oh, oh, somebody. I wonder how many people woke up this morning and thought God could come back. I did. I got on my face and I said, God, I want to make it, Lord. If you come back, I want to be ready. Amen. I don't want to be satisfied with just going to church anymore. I want God to change me. I want God to use me. I want God to put that passion in my soul. He doesn't want you to turn aside to some exciting distraction. The whole world's got all kinds of exciting distractions. People come to Las Vegas because they got all these attractions. It's exciting jumping off the stratosphere. It's exciting getting up there and taking that, that one ride that goes out and then tilts you down and slides you right up to the end. It's exciting when you get in that roller coaster on New York, New York, and it's zipping you around the hotel and you're... 
Well, it's the same way in the, in the world. The church, ha, uh, the church has to understand that the devil has all these attractions. He wants you to fall in love with. He wants you to lose your love for God. He wants you to lose your first love. He wants you to lose your first love. Unfortunately, that's what is occurring today. The impatience and the weariness of Christian struggles. It was the same thing that happened in Israel. It moved Israel, it, it moved the Israelites to take their eyes off the promised land and their goal. You see what happened? When Moses delayed his coming, guess what? They, they had a promised land in front of them. They had a promise. God was going to take them somewhere. But in that delay, in that delay of Moses coming down, in that delay, they began to get weary. They began to wax uh, 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 cold in their hearts. And, and they wanted to, they, they, they had forgotten because they got them a golden calf. They got them something to worship. That they forgot the promised land. They forgot what they had. Instead, they focused on more exciting and stimulating practices from the world that they had just left. You understand what happened to Israel? Like they, they remembered those idols and they wanted an idol. And even though they worshiped it as God, even though they sacrificed to it, we'll get into that a little deeper. The key to this process is found in verses four and five in the words that this is your God, O Israel. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is the feast of the Lord. Now, I'm going to get to this. I want you, I would to God that every young person was here today. Because I want you parents, to, maybe you'll get a hold of, maybe you'll get on your face and travail. And that you won't let your kids escape into this world that is coming at them at such a fast pace. Every time they pick up a phone, every time they get on their iPad, every time they watch, there's something zooming at them, coming at them. Uh, trying to get them to, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye the pride of life and it's coming non-stop at them non-stop and they don't see mom and dad praying they don't see dad prevailing they don't hear him crying out in the middle of the night amen you need to learn how to wake up and just get on your knees and say God before my kids leave this house somehow God let me touch heaven and now we're going to get into what really happened because that don't sound too bad. They got a golden calf. And even though it did make them forget about the promised land, they said, we're going to have a feast and we're going to eat and drink. And then what did it say? We're going to play, right? But hey, bird, does it, does that delay really happen like that? I guarantee you people only backslide because God has delayed his coming. That's the only reason. They don't believe he can come back right now. And the devil makes them think they can go out there and taste the world. And the world. And that's the worst mistake you'll ever make in your life. I'm going to tell you, I come out of the world, but there's scars on my heart. That I, oh, God forgave me. Believe me. God touched me, but there's still scars. I had an accident and I broke my collarbone. And when I put my hand right there, it's numb. I can't feel anything. It's numb. And the longer our young people and the longer our adults, the longer people stay out in the world, they become numb to the moving of God. They become numb to the things of God because they think they can come back anytime they want to. So does it matter? Does that thing about delay, well, let's ask King Saul. When, he, when God delayed Samuel's coming, remember that? When Samuel was supposed to come and offer up a sacrifice before they fought the Philistines? The Bible said that God delayed his coming. And so Saul said, you know what? I'm gonna take on, I'm gonna take on the role of the preacher. I'm gonna take on the role of the priest. And so he offered a sacrifice because Samuel delayed his coming. God delayed Samuel's coming. And when it was delayed, he offered up that sacrifice. And right when he offered it up, guess what? Samuel showed up. Well, I did it because the people wanted me to do it. I did it because the enemy, they're so big and our people are hiding, they're, they're, they're running. And I, I, wanted to, I wanted to offer up that sacrifice so bad, but he wouldn't wait on God. And Samuel said, your kingdom's coming to an end. God's going to give this kingdom 
Somebody that's after his own heart. The kingdom was rent from him. See, let's get back to Exodus 32. Did this celebration become the feast to the Lord because of a man in authority like Aaron proclaimed it? Just because a preacher, you got to watch these progressive preachers. You got to watch them because they'll proclaim a feast, man. They'll proclaim everything. Man, they don't care, man. Just come on, come as y'all. We're going to have a fun time. Church is fun to them. It's exciting being in, the, in their church because there's no hindrances. There's no anything. Come as you are. Believe what you want. Just come. And so uh, this celebration, notice it was a feast to the Lord because the man in the air claimed, no, that's not what it was. Is God pleased when his people worship him in ways other than how he's commanded? Is, is, is God pleased when we worship him other than how he's commanded us to worship him? I don't think so. God's creation, uh, God's reaction to the idolatrous festivals plainly shows they had turned aside from what he had believed, uh, but he had delivered to them through Moses. So he delivered them how they were supposed to worship through Moses. But when Moses had delayed his coming back, guess what? They began to just let everything go. So Exodus 32, 10, now notice what it says. Now, therefore, let me alone, God says, because of what they had done. God's saying now, now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make thee a great nation. Moses, you let me go get them. Let, let me do that. Moses was praying, no, no, don't do that. Because you see, here's what happened. The world's theologians call this the process of uh, of syncretism, syncretism, uh, which means the combination of different forms of beliefs or practices, the fusion of two or more original forms. So we got Pentecostal preachers that are progressive now. And what they did is they've latched on to a, a charismatic form of, of living and worship. And they try to uh, blend that with what God's word says. And so they're, they're deceiving people. They're deceiving people into losing out with God. The incident of the golden calf blends the worship of the true God with the worship of false gods. And the result is proclaimed to be worship of which is the true God. In other words, they're saying, well, we blended these two and we're worshiping the true God because they're calling on his name. But that's not the true God. That's not how God called them to worship them. Amen. God was indignant with the people for defining for themselves the nature of of the God they wanted to serve. In other words, they defined God as a golden calf. And so when they worship God as a golden calf, God can only think that they think he's the golden calf. But God is not a golden calf. You understand me? You can leave this church and you can go find somebody scratching your itching ears and, and you can say you're worshiping God, but if you're not worshiping him according to the word of God, you're not worshiping him. So I hope you understand what I just said. They were preventing the God of heaven from defining his own nature as revealed in his law, as revealed in his way and his actions for and against them. So in other words, they went against everything that God told Moses to tell them. They, they went against everything because they, they know what they want. They, they wanted a God. They wanted an idol because that's where their heart was still at. Their heart was still back there. They wanted to worship something they could see. They decided to define God's nature and to choose the form of a bull, a God, a God commonly worshiped in Egypt. Is God a bull? Of course not. Is God defined as, as confined to what a bull can do? No, God's not confined to what a bull can do. The modern thought uh, worshiping the bull seems silly and foolish, but the spiritual lesson involved is serious. You see, when you don't worship the one true God according to the way he tells us to worship him, you're serving idols. The essence of idolatry is defining the nature of God, not according to his word, but according to human experiences and ideas, remaking God in your own image, how you want him to be. 
What is the effect of man defining God according to his own ideas? His God uh, determines the standards. You see, when you no longer serve God, your God's going to determine the standards. I don't have to dress holy. I don't have to act holy. I don't have to be holy. But he that hath this hope that Jesus is coming back and you'll know him as he is because you'll be like him. He said, purify themselves. Purify themselves. But when you have your own God and you redefined him in your image, when you walked away from a holy God, he said, be ye holy for I am holy. Amen. And when you walk away from that, you define him as something less than a holy God. Then all of a sudden you began to live in a lesser standard. Well, my conscience don't bother me. No, because the God you worship says you can do that. But the longer you stay in the world and believe that, your conscience can be seared with a hot iron. God can take you so far, you can be taken so far away from God that God will just go ahead and let you go. But that's not what he wants. He doesn't want that. We're going to get to that. He wants you to come to him. So his, his God determines his standards. These standards are immediately seen in his conduct. In other words, when you uh, make God into your own image, we can see what kind of God you have by your conduct. How you live, how you act. Somebody say amen. Which can only rise as high as his God. Which we see in Exodus 32, 6, because what was, what was the highest they could get? They had a feast, they drank, and they played. That was their God. How many progressive churches, they, they eat, they drink, and they play? You're not going to hear conviction come from them. You're not going to hear what God's wrath is going to do to somebody that, that misses out on his coming. Oh, I wish you'd listen to me. And those, uh, it says, then they rose early on the next day, offering burnt offerings, a form of worship, <clears throat> and brought peace offerings, indicating fellowship between God and the priest. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Everybody say, rose up to play? What does that mean? One can recognize that it's not that there is not engaging, in, they weren't engaging in ordinary eating and drinking and playing. Because they wouldn't have said it that way if, if it would just been, oh, well, that's good. They were just having a feast. They were not throwing a ball around. They weren't shooting a ball through a hoop. They weren't kicking a soccer ball around having fun. They weren't that kind of playing. They were playing. They were playing. The people were involved in gluttonous, drunken, debauchery and the word play there means they were committing fornication and idolatry and I'm here to tell you that if you ever walk away from this true God the world will convince you that it's okay to commit fornication and commit idolatry. That's why it's so dangerous. And somebody, please hear me. We need to travail for our young people. We need to, they do not need to be in the world playing those games. Amen. They are ignorant to what's going on in the world. Playing. Debauchery. That's what was taking place while Moses delayed his coming. These people were involved in all of this. The symbolism is obvious. When the nature of the true God is falsely de defined, the effect will be spiritual adultery. You hear what I'm saying? There will be uh, a deterioration of your walk with God. There will be a deterioration of your uh, standards. A degeneration of society expressed in people's conduct. Plummeting standards and moral laxity are the fruit that is produced by somebody that walks away from the one true God. He is God and he alone. He's not going to give his glory to another. 
He's telling us, he's warning us that we better wake up in this last day. I'm here to tell you, friend, you better get a hold of an altar. You better learn how to pray and travail for your wife and for your husband and for your kids. You better learn how to travail for backsliders. I'm here to tell you that God wants us to travail until he breaks the heart of a backslider and brings him back in. But they won't come in just by uh, everybody patting them on the back. They're going to come in because the conviction of God is going to reach down in their heart. Why? Somebody's been travailing for them. Amen. Brother Jesse, I've been travailing for you. God's laid you on my heart. Every morning, I want you to know God has talked to me about you. I'm so glad that you're here today. I'm here to tell you that God's looking for a church that's just not going to play church, but be the church of the living God. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Writing of Christianity in the second century, historian Bill Durant observes, much of this difficult code of conduct, now notice what he says, much of this, this is the second century, much of this difficult code of conduct was preached by the apostle, by, by the apostolic church was grounded on the early return of Jesus Christ. The reason the apostles kept saying, bringing it to your remembrance, telling you to remember that there's going to be uh, false teachers, that there's going to be a spirit of the enemy. He's telling you how to live, be holy for he is holy. Got to be holy, got to be holy. He's telling you all these things because he knows that the reason that the apostles wrote it is because they were expecting Jesus to come back any day now. But as that hope faded, third century, fourth century, fifth century, 21st century, As hope faded, guess what happened to him? As hope began to fade, the voice of the flesh rose up again. And Christian morals were relaxed. You can always tell when the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist is working, when preachers that once held this truth turns away from it and tells people, it doesn't matter how you dress, it don't matter how you act, it doesn't matter uh, where you go, it doesn't matter what you do. Friend, I'm telling you, that's the spirit of the Antichrist and he wants to blind you. And that's what happened in, in the Bible in the second century. It said that the, the voice of the flesh rose up. How come? Because God had delayed his coming. They thought he was coming right away. And when somebody backslides, when somebody uh, falls away, it's because they don't believe Jesus could come back right now. And they're willing to roll the dice and take their chance. But I got news for you. You might not have another day. Young girl, 17 years old, just a few days ago, flipped her car and died. Kobe Bryant, this little 13-year-old girl, and he, he, uh, her and four others and Kobe all died in a helicopter accident. I'm here to tell you that you don't got another chance. You just can't live and say, I'll come back when I want to. That's the flesh rising up. That's the flesh telling you that, that it doesn't matter and your morals become laxed and you live the way you want to live. And you have no conviction. You have no concern. You're not concerned about a backslider. You're not concerned about your husband. You're not concerned about your wife. You're not concerned about your children. But we're saved. Because we spoke in tongues one time. We feel like we're okay. That's what the devil wants you to do. He wants you to feel like you've got a long time. You ain't got to worry about it. They never understood the principle of worshiping God as he instructed. In fact, it led to their eventual destruction and captivity of the children of Israel. Because they... We're not willing to wait. They got caught up in the delay. I want you to ask yourself, when's the last time you really thought, honestly, be, be honest with yourself. When's the last time you really thought Jesus could come back right now? And because you do not think about it, how have you lived since you received the Holy Ghost and has been baptized in Jesus' name? When God separated you out of the world, when God brought you out of the world, how are you living right now? Are you living like he could come back tomorrow? Then you'll take what the apostles wrote and you'll bring them to your remembrance just like he was telling them. Bring him to your remembrance. Peter, remembrance, 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 remembrance. I won't be, I won't be negligent, Paul said. 
to bring these things into your remembrance. Because Jesus is coming back. I know y'all are thinking, but Abel, what's happened to you? I'm telling you that I've got such a burden for this church. I've got such a burden for each of you. I don't want you to, to, to get lax. I don't want you to fall by the wayside. I don't want you to quit seeing him as he is a holy God. I want you to, to walk out of here the same way you came, but I want you to, to receive this burden. I want you to come down to, to let God touch you and change you and move on you until you get concerned about each other. Till you get concerned. Man, when you get concerned about each other, you're not going to fight. You're not going to think this. You're not going to think that. You're not going to gripe. You're not, you know why? I'm concerned. I, I got to go to God. And when you go to God and you travail, there's nobody else to listen to. There's nobody else to talk to. You're talking to God. I pray and I can't even get up until I know that God has taken everything out of me for you. I am asking God to take me on a journey. The problem of these times of apostasy falling away is because those whom Paul describes as falling away are people who are not enjoying God. Oh, did you hear what I said? The children of Israel, they, they were eating, drinking, drunking, gluttony, debauchery, playing. Oh, brother, does that word playing really mean that? Well, what do people say when they, uh, guys, we're going to go out, well, I'm playing around in the world. He's a player. Oh, I bumped a stump. See, we just hear a preacher preach and it goes out. You don't really get the impact of it. Are you a player? Are you a child of God? Is your walk with God playful? Or is it anointing? Do you feel something when you come into the house of God? Do you feel something when God begins to burden you down with souls? Let's give the Lord a hand clap. So those whom Paul describes as falling away are people who are not enjoying God and the blessings that he provides. But rather they have fallen into an outward form of religion. That's why when kids backslide, they go out into the world and they get entangled with relationships and they have no clue what a relationship is. And then all of a sudden they're forced upon. They, they have to make a decision and, and they already made a decision by leaving the church. So you think they're going to make the right decision in the backseat of an automobile? They have an outward form of religion. That's what progressive Pentecostal is. It's an outward form of religion, but there's no true worship because they're not living for God. They're not obeying God's word. They're living the way they want. And that sounds like Romans chapter 1. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 18, Brother Amy. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. So all unrighteousness, he sees that. Go ahead. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now he's talking to backsliders because he said who holds the truth in unrighteousness. If you never had the truth, you can't hold it in unrighteousness. That's why you better be careful not to backslide. That's why you better be careful to stay on your face before God. Because God is going to have the wrath of God is going to be revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness for men. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Go ahead. Because that which may be known of God. Oh, listen now. now. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it unto them. So we know that God's shown it unto them. Go ahead. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. For the invisible things of him are clearly seen. Being understood by the things that are made. Be understood by the things that are made. Even his eternal power and God. Even his eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without Excuse. So you're without excuse because uh, you don't want to serve God. You think I can serve him any way I want to. If you don't serve him the way he tells you to serve him, you're in idolatry. You have a form of religion. Go ahead. Because that 
when they knew God, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not. As they God. glorified him not. How many of us came in here today and glorified God as he is? Not as we think he is, but as he is. When the song service steps up next, next uh, service, are you going to worship God as he is or how you think he is? Because if you worship me the way you think he is, you're not going to have joy. You're going to be waiting, man, how long are they going to sing that song? I don't like that song. That, that's what happens. Some of y'all laughing because you know you've done it. Because when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. What? Neither were thankful. See, that's what when you backslide because you don't, you, you, you quit being thankful. You quit being thankful for what God did for you. If you were uh, where I was at and God saved you, you would be so thankful. Man. I'm so thankful. I'm thankful I didn't jump. I'm thankful that God put his hand on me. I'm thankful that God moved me back to a town where somebody witnessed to me years before. I'm thankful that God brought me to that church that night. I'm thankful that I was filled with the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. I'm thankful that I'm still living for him. I'm thankful I'm in, in Las Vegas right now in this church. I'm thankful. But because when they knew God, they glorified not as God, neither were thankful. But what? But became vain in their imagination. They became vain in their imaginations. They and their think foolish heart was darkened. Their foolish heart was darkened. See, that's what happens when you quit worshiping God according to who he says he is. When you uh, heap to yourself teachers with itching ears, all of a sudden you find out what is really happening in your life. Because when they knew God, they glorified not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination and their foolish heart was darkened. Some of y'all don't know what dark is. Some of y'all been around this church so long, you've had so much marvelous light, you don't know what true darkness is. You don't know what darkness is when you have to get high just to make it through a day. You don't know what darkness is until you stay drunk because you're so uh, bitter at the world that you just can't stand to be in it anymore. Notice what they said. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed now here it the is. Glory. Here. And changed the what? The glory of the uncorruptible God into the images made like to corruptible man. My, my, my. That sounds like Israel, didn't it? That sounds like what's been going on for generation after generation after generation. Jeremiah 2.11 says, Half a nation changed their gods, which are not yet gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. In other words, they're saying, man, you don't change. Your glory is in your knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. Your glory is in the oneness of God. Your glory is that you know who he is. Don't you dare change that. Don't make him less than who he is. Don't remake him in your image so you can do what you want to do, but learn how to get on your face and say, God, I need you. I need you right now. I don't want to backslide. I don't want to fall away. Back to 24 now. One, Romans 1, 24. Back, verse 24. Wherefore, also God gave them up to uncleanliness through See, the lust of their own flesh. When you get out there, you're not guaranteed to come back. You get out there and the longer you stay, the harder your heart gets, the deeper the scars, and now you become numb. And after the numbness comes, your conscience being seared. Man, I, I gotta stop there. Who changed the truth of God into a lie Worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Every head, every head now. How do you see your God? In our actions and the way we live, have we remade God into our image? Have we defined the nature of God so that we can live the way we want to live and go and do what we want to do and act the way we want to act? Or have we acknowledged him as being God Almighty? Yeah, God has delayed his coming. 
But be careful because he's coming as a thief in the night. When you think not, that's when he's coming. And in this last day, the devil wants these young people, he wants everybody to just uh, lose that, that urgency that Jesus is coming back so that they can, uh, their, 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 his coming's delayed so that they can just do what they want to do thinking they have enough time to get back into this truth. If any man be in Christ, he's a, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And all things that are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing the transgressions of, uh, up unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In other words, we were reconciled to God. To wit, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. But when there's a backslider, when there's somebody that fell away, God's saying, I've given you, believers, that same ministry of reconciliation. That if you'll get on your face and you'll travail and pray, God will re reconcile those backsliders. Sliders. God will touch their heart. God will give them hope. But it takes us finding out that we're going to live for God the way he has defined himself. Everybody say amen. God bless you. I want you to know that I love you so much. Jesse, I love you. I want you to be reconciled. I want these young people that are not here, I want them to be reconciled. It's going to take us moving into a deeper realm with God. Not desiring the things of this world, but the things from heaven. God, go with us today. God bless you. We're dismissed to the next service. I hope God touched your heart.